to our first, hopefully, annual organic summit. Um, something that has been a passion of mine for a while, and um, we've tried to get it going and get it in place, and hopefully it can grow from here and become something that we can hang our hat on in this region as a, as a good resource for um, growers and retailers and everybody else. So, again, I'd like to thank you for coming. I'd like to put a, a shout out right away to the team that really put this together. Um, I had the idea, and that was about as far as it went. <laughs> Everyone else picked up all the slack. I'd like to point out Janet. She's at the front table. Without her, this was not possible. And I'd like to apologize to her publicly for putting her through all the pain that I have by doing this. Last night, 9 o'clock, still working hard, trying to get everything done. It's been many nights like that. And I'd like to point the rest of my team, uh, Randy here, May, and Herb. Megan had part in this too with um, many different things that we had to get put together. And I thank them for that and appreciate it a lot. Uh, my name's Randy Stratton. I'm your MC for the next day and a half. And we're going to get the program going. And uh, thank you all for coming here today and joining us. And uh, I think we've got a lively schedule, a lot of great speakers. And uh, we're going to start off with um, the morning here uh, with a really a, a capstone here, a way, a way to really get the bigger picture of, of why we're here, what the world looks like, how it's changing. So we're fortunate to have with us uh, uh, Katrina Hines is going to join us here as our keynote from Minneapolis. Uh, we're fortunate to have some of her time. She's a busy person. Uh, she is the president of a KH Principles uh, consulting firm in Minneapolis. Um, she serves on the board of directors of the Lundberg Family Farms, family-owned, operated producer of organic rice and rice products, and serves as board chair of the Organic Farming Research uh, Foundation, a farmer-led nonprofit that works to foster the improvement and widespread adoption of organic farming systems. Uh, she's also involved with the, uh, on the, uh, served as the scientist member of the National Organic Standard Board uh, in the past. And um, with that, had, of course, many responsibilities and, and things with the oversight of uh, the NOP and, and organic standards. Uh, Katrina spent 22 years at General Mills, so she got to see a lot of development uh, from the very beginning, the very genesis of new products that uh, were going to be introduced and, and how those were developed with, uh, within the organic standards. Uh, she was the, uh, and most recently as the organic, uh, General Mills Organic Ambassador. In that role, she was responsible for uh, representing organic movement, consumers and farmers within the organization and consulted with brands on their mission and work and served on the executive team of five brands, including the uh, Cascadian Farm in Muir Glen. And during her time as Organic Ambassador General Mills, um, the organic business grew to be the second largest in the United States. Uh, so before we get started, um, uh, I guess it's, we got uh, Katrina. Do we have her? Okay, there she is right there. Good morning. Everybody see her okay? Okay. Welcome, Katrina. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Is there, uh, is there anything else, uh, Katrina, that uh, you, think, you think the folks out there should know about you? Thank you so much, Randy, and thank you for having me. I uh, wish I could be a person. I wish I could see the audience. Uh, it's a little hard to react to yourself, but we'll see how this goes. Um, you know, I think there's, it's always so important to know uh, the lens through which someone is speaking. So I thought there were two stories uh, that folks should know about me. So one is I come to everything with an environmental lens. I grew up uh, north of San Francisco and during my formative years, we had a lot of droughts. Um, we had to keep, you know, and as a teenager, you'd think that's miserable. I, we had to keep bricks in the toilet uh, to conserve water. And when I went to college in LA, 
where apparently all our Northern California water was being sent, um, I was truly appalled by all the watering of sidewalks and swimming pools. Um, and that's really where perhaps my, um, this, this lens of just how our human um, behavior impacts the world we live in and how I could um, make a difference with that. So just know that that's a lens that I come to organic um, in my professional life. Um, the second story I would share with you is uh, that I come to things with a lens around the impact we can have. Um, and that really comes from Gene Kahn, who was the founder of Cascadian Farm. Um, he founded it in 1972 in Skagit Valley, Washington. He was very influential in the formation of the organic standards. And um, by the 90s, um, Cascadian Farm was the most widely distributed organic brand. He was in several categories, uh, but Gene was frustrated. He was frustrated that he'd spent, you know, 30 years of his life uh, trying to work uh, to reduce pesticide use. That was his cause for the environment. Um, and organic was only, you know, at the time, 1% of cropland. And, you know, let's be honest, it hasn't grown much since that. Um, and he just didn't feel he'd had the impact. So he did a little math calculation and he realized that if he could get a large food company to reduce their pesticide usage 3%, that would be the entire organic industry combined. And so he changed his mission. He decided to find a company that um, could maybe get on his vision with him um, and could accomplish that goal. So he you know, went through uh, a series of Business deals in 2000 sold to General Mills. In 2003, became the first chief sustainability officer for General Mills. And by 2012, had reduced um, pesticide usage by General Mills 5%. Um, you know, uh, accomplishing his goal and accomplishing what Organic had done, uh, but in a much shorter time frame. Uh, when I got involved professionally, um, inorganic. It was at Gene's behest. And um, really his charge to me was to think about impact. So I just share that story so you know that that's how I think about um, some of the topics we'll talk about today. Thanks, Randy. Great. Uh, I, I did forget to mention too that uh, Katrina's got a PhD in chemistry from the University of Illinois. Uh, so that was, I'm sure that was quite helpful going into looking at the science of food and nutrition and those things. And I, and I think that uh, the foundation there led to quite a career. So which brings us full circle here today for having someone like Katrina with us. Um, and before I get into some of the Q&A here with Katrina, some of the back and forth, I just want to let everybody know, those watching virtually and those here today, if you've got some questions, uh, write them down and then we'll have some time for that as well. And those are watching virtually, please send those in. We've got a microphone right over here uh, to the right of the stage here that you could use. So I'm gonna start some questions here. Uh, Katrina and I are just gonna have some back and forth here for a while and, and kind of look at what's the big picture look like? What, uh, what, are we, what can we expect as we move forward here in the, in the next five years or more? So because, this, because 2020 was such an anomaly in terms of what had happened in our world and the business cycles and supply chains and, and trying to keep uh, our world economy moving. Um, which this, so we're gonna address that in, in the first question here is, what are the big picture food trends that may have gained additional attention during the pandemic that will become part of the mainstream thinking in the future in the, in the, food, uh, in the food industry? Thanks, Randy. I'm laughing that you brought up my uh, chemistry degree my uh, two young adults and certainly my yes. high school junior who just finished chemistry would tell you that I know no chemistry and, and totally not helpful. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of the least important of anything okay. um, that I have. Sure. Big food trends. You know, we could spend eight hours talking yeah. about um, trends that are affecting food. And Randy, as you and I prepped for this, we went. Uh, kind of round and round trying to hone in on the ones that I think are most important. And I think there's four. 
Um, so let me kind of hit them. And I know later in our Q and A, hopefully we can get a little mm -hmm. bit over. And I'm really hoping that the audience will challenge me and mm -hmm. ask the probing questions. So I think the third one, first one is a growing awareness. And this has been coming, but I think it continues to grow um, that food is really the foundation of our health. That you know our bodies are machines or temples, depending on how you want to think about it, and that the fuel that we feed them uh, really has impacts for our health today, how we feel today, but also our health in the future. And so we're seeing uh, both a growing interest in functional foods, a growing interest in nutrient dense foods, and uh, but probably more broadly, just a more um, thoughtful understanding of global diets, um, the health of global diets, uh, looking at uh, vegetable-based diets and really understanding that. Um, and I think a corollary to that is what I would call one-to-one uh, -one experimentation, right? That each of us as individuals is really um, on a journey with this and is trying to understand um, our individual body and what makes our individual body work best. So I think that's the first really big trend is this food is health. The second I would talk about is access to information. So I think about my two young adults, I have a 16 year old and a 21 year old, a girl and a boy, and they have not lived in a world where they could not Google the answer to their question. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, I'm sure many in our audience are parents or, you know, have siblings or maybe fall into this category. We could, again, spend eight, spend eight hours talking about the goods and the bads of this, but they expect answers. They expect to be able to have the information at their hand. And when they can't get it, it causes distrust, right? So if they, when you think about uh, what this means for food, um, when they read an article that, um, you know, farm workers don't have access to restrooms in California. They're gonna look at a brand that they buy food from and they're gonna expect that brand to be able to say, do the farm workers who grew my food that's on my plate tonight for dinner, do they have access to restrooms, right? Similarly, if they read about neonics and the effects on monarch butterflies, they expect to be able to Google and have the company answer that. And when they don't get answers, they don't trust those brands. So they are looking for companies that have the answers to those questions. So it's really what I would call radical transparency and radical transparency. Um, mm. And that has huge implications that we're just starting to figure out how to answer. Um, so the third trend um, is really income inequality. We are in an economy, this was certainly pre-COVID, um, but accelerated by COVID where, um, you know, our economy is splintering. There are uh, folks who are really benefiting from the economy. They weren't impacted by COVID nearly at all. They could work from home. Um, their network worth grew in the stock market. I checked this last night and it's a really daunting statistic, but the 614 American billionaires uh, earned during COVID uh, added a trillion dollars to their net worth. At the same time, there's folks who are not benefiting. The um, median income in the household income for a family of four is fifty thousand dollars. And uh, during COVID, and and this was happening again be before COVID. Uh, but during COVID, the number of households that are food insecure or housing insecure uh, grew to over 10%, um, 12, 13% in some places, um, unprecedented um, during my lifetime. And so that really has implications for how people are spending on food, how they think about food. And I, and I know we'll talk about that um, in a little bit, but that's a, that's a really macro trend that we all have to wrestle with um, in food. You know, people have to eat um, every day and how we feed them and care for them um, is a really important thing that we think about in the food industry. And certainly I know our farmers think about this since you grow the food that we all eat. And then finally, climate change. Um, I know that you know it was coming. Um, you know, this is really big. And I think um, the implications, farmers have known 
um, and been feeling these implications for a while, right? We have um, farmers dealing with pests that they've never dealt with before, um, un, you know, weird weather patterns. You know, the big uh, effect of climate change is unpredictable weather. And hello, just this year, wildfires, you know, double, triple hurricanes, hurricanes that the South has not seen before. Texas froze. Um, I know a farmer in Missouri, they hit minus 18 on a day that the previous record was five. You know, these are things that make farming incredibly challenging. Um, and people are starting to really understand this. Businesses are starting to understand, certainly food businesses are starting to understand that um, unpredictable weather patterns means uh, their business is at risk. Being able to find the ingredients that they um, need for their business at prices that work um, is really at risk. And so everyone's thinking about this and everyone is doing, um, you know, is trying to figure out what to do about it. For specific to food companies, this is really honed in on um, agriculture. You know, food companies know that um, the bulk of their um, climate impact happens uh, before they get the ingredients. It's happening in agriculture, um, over 50%. It's 85% for water. Um, if we were going to talk about um, water, which certainly is a, a related topic. Um, and so they need to think differently about how they work in their supply chains um, to build healthy soil to address some of these issues. So those are the four big trends. Okay. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to move along here, uh, looking at the uh, some of the uh, more common words you're going to be hearing. If you certainly all of us, we've heard about uh, inorganic. The standards are: uh, Are we going to have more transparency? Is there going to be more traceability? So, if transparency and traceability are truly going to become a bigger part of the brand building strategy for food companies, how does that translate to the grower, and what relationship can they expect to have? with their supply chain management and customers in the future? Great question. Um, and I know uh, farmers are inundated by surveys and questionnaires and audits. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I wish I could say that that was gonna change, but that's not gonna change. Yeah. Um, you know, we can hope for maybe some efficiency in that. Um, but I think what I wanna talk about is, you know, this is really a new skill in supply chain. Um, if I think about my time at General Mills, we were always talking to the buyers about needing stories, needing to be able to answer these questions. And our buyers don't know how to do this. Um, they, don't, they don't, you know, in most cases, buyers aren't farmers. They don't maybe understand the supply chain. They don't understand how to generate these stories. So they're building new skills. At the same time, you know, the middlemen who are buying from farmers and moving ingredients to General Mills, they maybe perhaps hadn't really understood the need. They don't uh, understand what it takes to sell, um, you know, to sell the story of how food is grown. That is something we've lost, I would say. Um, so the the big the big point here is we all have to figure out how to do this. But I think there's some good models in the food system. The very best farmers um, across the United States, regardless of scale, um, they do it all right. You farmers, you're head of operations, you're the CFO, you're the mechanic, uh, you're researcher sales, and now you're marketing. And um, there's some farmers out there who do this phenomenally. Um, and I know um, I have the luxury of spending time with farmers across the United States. And these stories exist. There's amazing stories to be told. Um, my CSA diversified vegetable farmer that I buy from is a great marketer. She really helped us understand this year when she and her husband moved to a new piece of land, why we weren't getting Brussels sprouts, for example, because it was just a total crop failure. Um, but we learned so much as members of her CSA. You know, another story I think about, and, and these exist everywhere and you have them in your region. Um, in Skagit Valley, uh, it's where 90% of spinach seed is grown. And spinach seed has to be on a 10-year rotation. So no farmer has enough land 
to rotate that on their own land. So all the farmers get together and they have this map and they pin where they're gonna grow spinach seed and they work collectively. And it's this magic story of these farmers working together to grow the world's spinach seed. And no one knows it. It's not a story they're telling. And I would challenge farmers, whether it's the story on your farm or how you as farmers are getting together to build uh, this transparency or doing cool things, um, those are the stories that need to be tell, told, and that's how you can work together to help the supply chain. But at the same time, supply mm-hmm. chain is going to be coming with more questions, more um, information that they need. Um, an example I would close with on this topic, um, in Europe, there's a produce company, and the name's escaping me right now, and they have uh, this thing they call the um, sustainability flower. And basically, the idea is that Um, they recognize that every buyer of food has a different set of values. I might care about water and farm workers. Someone else may care about soil health and energy. And so every farm that they grow produce has answered questions about each of these values and when you, uh, and has a number. And so when you buy the apple, you can look at the number, you can go to their website and you can choose which of those values matter. And so what retailers have done, and so a certain retailer will say, the values we're gonna sell on are water and soil health. And so they screen which farms they'll accept produce from or won't accept produce from. And it's created a totally different supply chain. Again, this isn't fresh produce, right? It would look different in grain, but I think we can expect more things like that coming down the mm-hmm. pipe. Sure, okay, thank you. Uh, so both in Europe and USA, we're, we're hearing more and more com- conversations about, you know, the ecological aspect of, of soil health and uh, organic uh, land, certified organic land, regenerative organic land, new, new standard that's coming as well. In, in Europe, they're pressing it a bit further, mainly from how they're, the nomenclature that's both put in policy and also put in marketing. And one of those is uh, nature positive farming. And they're basically starting to look at that, put metrics around that, connected to the ecology of that area. And so this movement uh, in Europe, uh, with their efforts for soil health and ecological farming, begin to adapt more global standards. But we all know we're in a global supply chain for food. I think in some ways that's a detriment as we saw uh, during a pandemic, some of our supply chains broke. And so obviously, if we can get more nutrient-dense food closer to the markets, closer to where it's needed, the better. Uh, so the big question is, you know, where, uh, where we're gonna see more of this investment and in seeing some of these uh, uh, standards being raised. And so again, nature-positive farming in Europe, ecological practices, soil health, so how does that uh, translate then into these, these uh, both USA standards and uh, global standards for uh, food and, and beverages? Uh, interesting question. Um, you know, the, I think the first thing to say about this is there's a really big difference between um, European consumer sentiment on the environment mm-hmm. and, yeah. um, and it's really about our land availability. Um, you know, we are blessed in the United States with just an abundance of land. I'm mm-hmm. sure in New York City it doesn't feel that way, but right, <laughs> everywhere else there's there's plenty of land. Um, right. And so a, a, a example that'll bring this home, my husband um, also works for General Mills and he worked in Switzerland for a year. And when he moved into the apartment um, that he was renting, they made this huge deal about the garbage bags and how he had to use a certain kind of garbage bag. And if he didn't, uh, it'd be like, he'd be thrown in jail. I'm not sure it was that serious, but um, you know, with the language translation, it sounded really scary. And so it turns out that um, you can only throw away trash in certain garbage bags. You have to go buy them at the store and they're like $15 a piece. They're very expensive. Um, And it is a huge fine if you don't use them. And the reason for that is Switzerland is out of landfill. They have to export all their trash. They have no land. And so in an effort to really reduce trash because they have this land limitation, 
so hard for us to imagine here in the United States that um, they've changed consumer behavior by basically making it ridiculously expensive to throw out trash. So what you see there is huge recycling, very little packaging on mm. food um, or on anything, um, and a real focus on trash reduction. It's like really phenomenally different than anything you would see here. Um, and so the environment, because of this land limitation, the environment is a top purchasing consideration for consumers. And we're just not there in the United States yet. Um, folks are still very focused on um, feeding their families, this health component we talked about. Um, and, and it's very, I would say, leading edge consumers, although a growing number of consumers who are um, making purchases you know, as with environment as their leading cause. Um, so I think that's important to talk about. Um, but the other thing we should talk about is just um, when you're selling something, differentiation matters, right? So organic for a long time was the differentiator. Certainly Cascadian Farm benefited from that as an example, but other brands as well, right? If you were the first um, organic frozen vegetables, you could you know, grow your business and really grow on the strength of the organic brand. Um, but today in frozen vegetables, there are many organic frozen vegetables. And so differentiating on organic isn't good enough anymore. And so you need to be doing something else. Um, at the same time, um, you know, there's some early warning signs that uh, organic is being challenged in the United States. Certainly um, with the fight over biodynamic, um, there's folks who feel organic has kind of lost its way. And so you see the growth of real organic or regenerative organic. Um, I think, you know, as we've had more packaged organic food, there's folks who question is it is, you know, is an organic cookie really healthier than a non-organic apple? And frankly, there's just a lot more competition, right? So if I think about the cereal aisle where uh, we also worked in Cascadian Farm, there's just a lot of organic cereal. And so folks are looking for um, new ways to differentiate, which is just mm -hmm. gonna cause more labels. Um, and there's also, as consumer needs change, there's the desire to more uh, effectively communicate that we're helping the environment, for example. Um, or that we're helping pollinators. So I think about the Be Better Certified uh, work being done by Xerces, um, something that I'm involved with. Like how do we communicate a very specific um, benefit of buying this food? Um, so there's some caution there, but um, I think the big picture is there's good news for organic. There's plenty of room, the um, tailwinds that are pushing organic to grow um, mm -hmm. are still there. Um, the benefits uh, for consumers are still there. Um, but I, I do think we're just going to see more different kinds of labels um, as we adapt to, to just a growing population that wants to shop their values. That was a complicated answer, but. That's a complicated one. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned labels because I just made a note to myself. I know we talked about the fractionation of labels and, and more and more labels are coming and these discussions are out there. and. Uh, the clean label uh, debate is a big one, and it's front and center. Um, and uh, I, I think I, I think I see an email on it probably once a week. And you, Katrina, I'm sure you see it every day. Um, it's it's going to be uh, interesting to see how we get through the uh, enormity of trying to separate all the different labels that are coming and and what's in those labels and what they mean to the consumer because the consumer is having a hard time, frankly. Right? I mean. At the, at the grocery store. And we've got to get this figured out because there are a lot of different labels out there. Do you want to just elaborate on where we're going to shuffle these labels, Katrina, and maybe how it's going to shake out perhaps? What it's going to look like, uh, let's say, a year or two from now? Well, organic is going to keep growing. I have no doubts yeah. about that. Um, but I'll tell you, right, there is no um, crystal ball on this. Um, anyone who has a crystal ball hopefully is off doing it and will uh, join those billionaires we talked about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, the, and you're right, it, like the average consumer, right? You're not, 
you're not really picking up a product and like reading the label and understanding it. You have like a nanosecond to make a decision about a product. Um, so, you know, the optimist in me says that um, maybe we can get to more radical transparency, right? Mm -hmm. Where consumers can really look for what they want and um, our, our labeling will sort itself out into some um, easy way for consumers to get those answers. Um, the cynic in me says that's just not going to happen. We've tried it with nutrition labeling in this country for 30 years to get to uh, some easy way to help people understand whether food is healthy or not. And um, we have not been successful in that. Um, and I, um, hopefully there's no marketers in the room, but marketers are marketers, right? They are trying to make their product different than everybody else's. There's really no incentive to, for uh, collaboration on it. Um, so I think the labeling thing, we're just going to continue to see, um, you know, we'll settle in for a while and then there'll be more. Um, there'll be more. There'll be more. Yeah. There'll be more. <laughs> my, my coffee has 14 labels on it. There it's you very go. I laugh every morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, now I want to bring this closer to home for everybody here that's here today and, and, and watching uh, virtually, is um, how can these efforts and investments in soil health, organic crops, regenerative standards begin to help rural America in places like South Dakota, rural South Dakota, rural Minnesota, um, and, and local economies, perhaps some of those things. Uh, I know you're not an economist, Katrina, but uh, you've looked at a lot of studies uh, you've you've lived in Minnesota for a long time, and uh, what what do you where do you see this going to help rural America? Because you know so many of our smaller towns are or have been drying up, obviously, and people have been leaving. Where do you see some of this maybe making changes from that standpoint? Could that uh, could that make a difference down the road? Do you think? I'm glad you asked this question after the last one. I think there's nothing but good news here. Um, while I talked about really not having a crystal ball for the future of labeling, I think the crystal ball on farming practices is really obvious. We talked about big companies um, really realizing that they need to work on soil health. And the, and the great thing about big companies is they know they can't do it by themselves. They know they need to have an impact. They build coalitions, they plant seeds, they try a whole bunch of different things. And we're seeing that on soil health. 201, the big food companies are working on this. They all recognize that uh, this is a big idea that can um, benefit their supply chains and benefit farmers. And I'll get back to that second point in a minute, right? And so I think the there, there is solidifying agreement that uh, we know what these practices are, right? So farmers who are cover cropping, um, increasing the rotations, having really diverse rotations, mm -hmm. um, thinking about tillage, um, maybe incorporating livestock onto their farms, um, thinking how to reduce inputs. Um, that's really creating a virtual cycle. The more of those practices you implement, the healthier the soil becomes, the healthier the ecosystem that allows you to then reduce inputs more, um, which has, certainly has a cost benefit. Um, and it is building a farm system that is really resilient to these weather patterns that farmers are having to deal with. Um, but what's interesting is, so, so farmers, farms are building more uh, ecosystem resilience, but they're also building more financial resilience. Um, I think there's really good opportunity, as I've said, for uh, these innovative farmers who are taking on these practices to sell into markets. The markets, you know, certainly organic will continue to be a market for farmers who are doing this, but I think other markets are gonna grow, right? As all these big companies are looking to be able to say we're having an impact, they're looking for solutions. Um, and they know that uh, they have to build markets to make this work for farmers. Um, so, so a couple things as we think about rural America and kind of farmer economics. Um, one specific thing that COVID did is really highlighted for a growing number of Americans um, how disconnected they are from food. Um, and I think about my neighbors in suburban Minneapolis 
who know what I do and have had zero interest in asking questions about my CSA or the farmer's market and how many questions I answered. I mean, we all saw the stories about the meat supply and I didn't have meat problems because I buy meat from a local farmer and all my friends knew that. And all of a sudden they were super interested in it. My CSA farmer sold out CSA shares um, before she even went public with it. Um, our farmer's market sales across the United States um, doubled. People, okay. there's this hunger to connect and to, people are starting to understand that um, we need to take care of our farmers and we need to have this relationship with farmers. Um, and so farmers who are willing to take that work will find markets, I'm confident in that. Um, and then one, one study I would point to was by John Reginald um, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science um, that showed that specific to organic, farmers, uh, certified organic farmers are 22 to 35% more profitable than non-organic farmers. So again, I think there's data to support that if you're doing these practices, things will come. Um, and then I'm just gonna close uh, with this. Um, Cause I do think it's an important for farmers to know that if you do this, um, the, the markets will come. So um, General Mills helped fund here, you guys can see this, mm -hmm. uh, soil by the Nature Conservancy. It was a big study to look at both, uh, what would be the impacts if cropland was converted to these soil, uh, healthy soil building practices, um, and then also what would it take? So the study found that if 1%, 1% of cropland was converted to um, having healthy soil as its leading metric, um, it had all these environmental benefits. But I think the one I point to is it would turn $37 million into farmers' pockets. Um, so you think that's 1%. Think of what would happen if we could do more of it. Um, so certainly the economies are there. Um, but they also acknowledged, they have this little um, graphic that's the roadmap mm -hmm. of what it will take to get there. Um, and there's certainly science things that it'll take. There's certainly um, policy things. Um, but they acknowledge that they have to build markets for this. So companies are trying to figure out what are the markets that we build? Um, it, it's a great piece of work. I would encourage everyone to look at it. You can find it at uh, Rethink Soil at the Nature Conservancy. Um, but again, I think it builds a case that the markets will come um, for farmers who are doing this work. Great, thank you for that. Okay, so why don't we just take this moment now for some uh, Q&A. Uh, those of you watching virtually, you can submit questions. It'll show up on my screen here, then I'll read those off for the audience. And then anybody here, if you've got a question, there's a microphone right here uh, for Katrina. Anything that we've covered today, uh, any, any big picture questions or what, uh, what you heard that was of interest to you, um, this is your big chance right now to get, uh, get your thoughts out. Share it with us. Anybody? Any brave soul here locally? But you can't let me yeah, Sam, why don't you go up there if you would, yeah. Especially since we invoked the uh, CSA uh, part. There's a microphone right there. Yep, there you go. Katrina, can you hear me? I can. My name is Sam. I grew up in South Dakota, and I'm a production agronomist with Den Bestens. And for the last 10 years, we've been running a CSA in the southeast corner of South Dakota. Nice. COVID doubled that demand, and it was a latent demand that was there, <clears throat> but I couldn't understand in the beginning when we started it why people weren't supporting it. Now I have a better understanding. Mm. Uh, my big question has to do with climate change, which I have been doubtful about in the past, um, maybe changing some since then but going back to the very nature of the carbon cycle as we look at organic matter in native soils that have never been broke when we look at soil health 
moving forward to build nutrient density in the crops that we grow, how can that be identified as a carbon sink in answers to where the future of our uh, controlling carbon waste into the air? Do you understand that, Katrina? Yeah, I do. That's a big question. It's a big question. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't. I can't make that more simple, but you'll understand it. Yeah. Um, First, congratulations on your CSA. Thank Um, you. Yeah, well, you've landed. I I held up the Soil Health Roadmap, and Mm -hmm. I had said that science was kind of the first half. There's, um, you know, if, if you've ever gone out on farms and dug, yeah, I'm sure all, all of you have, obviously, right? But if you've dug uh, in the soil, you know, in October uh, on a corn soy conventional rotation, maybe an organic, pretty basic rotation, and then you've looked at someone who really has cover crops year round, maybe has some perennials, has livestock. Um, there's a difference. And so our intuition really points to, we know that when we're doing these practices, um, we're keeping carbon in the soil. We know that. Um, The science hasn't quite caught up to how do we like measure it and prove it. Um, So there has to be a little bit of faith in this work as the scientists work. And you know, I'm a scientist. The scientists like to argue, they're really perfectionist. And so you've got all these scientists arguing about what's exactly the right way to measure it and what depth. Um, but I, I think we can't we can't wait for that to come. It will come. Um, we know that that's work that has to be done, but um, in the meantime, we have, we have to take care of our soil and keep growing it. Um, I just read a study, uh, I think it's some ridiculous number, 60% of the soil in Iowa is has like washed away. Like these like really scary numbers that um, I think really impact farmers ability to keep farms in the family, do the things that you worry about, support your families, build your communities. Um, and so we just can't, we can't necessarily wait for the science to catch up. That's a simple question, Thanks. complicated. Interesting. I hope that helped Sam. I'll- Sam. And I'm just going to make just one quick anecdote uh, before we uh, uh, thank uh, Katrina here, move on. Uh, but one is just along that same line with the economics, talk to a young farmer out west here in the last few months, and they want to farm organic and they want to do more. And he said, Randy, if we can do, we can transition our land and farm organic out here, we can hire people to work with me because obviously it's more labor intensive. And we maybe we can open up a, a cafe again in our small town. You know, maybe we can do this. Maybe we can do that. They said, you know, they they've got a. They're looking at all different things to keep the you know bring 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 young people back to some of these rural areas. So this is an economic issue in a lot of ways, not just a nutrition and health issue. It's an economic issue for rural rural America. So we've got some opportunities there. So with that, hey, Randy, uh, if there's can I can I throw yes, in one please? I'm sorry. Yes, I'm, I'm yes. going to take the Todd microphone privilege. There you go. <laughs> You know, a yeah. big, a big, <laughs> big change in COVID that we didn't talk about yeah. um, is the ability to work from home, yeah. right? My 21-year-old right. will finish college next year, and her internships were all remote. Um, many, My husband, um, he's like, I don't know when I'm going back to work. You kind of don't need to. I have a neighbor who works at 3M. They closed his office and said, you'll be working from home forever. And that I think offers huge, huge benefits to rural America, yeah. where young people have the ability to have, um, you know, to do jobs that they had to move to the cities to, but now don't have to. Um, I am very interested in what will happen in the next ten years, where young people can choose to live where they want, um, in lifestyles that they want, um, and don't have to live in San Jose, California, or. That's right. And that, and they're they're in that could benefit some rural economies, couldn't it? Some small yeah, towns. Sure. I think yeah. rural economies will absolutely benefit from that. Yeah, fantastic. Good point. 
Okay, so uh, we're, we're, at the, we're at the 10 o'clock hour. So, May, do you want to run your program now? Or, shoot, do you want to go to coffee? You guys, your, what would you like to do, May? Five-minute break? We're going to do a five-minute break, coffee break. Let's thank uh, Katrina for her role this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. We have a really big topic for you today, and we have a powerhouse of gals to cover all of the bases, everything relevant, everything you ever wanted to know and more about organic regulations. So I titled this panel Strengthening Organic Rules and Certification because we are going to get down to the nitty gritty on a proposed rule called Strengthening Organic Enforcement. It's a really important topic. It's very near and dear to my heart as a former organic inspector. My name is May Petra and I work with Dakota's Best Seed. And I wear a lot of different hats, but my job title is Production Protocol Manager. So let your imagination go wild. Um, today we have with us Rebecca Ritson, a good friend of mine, and also the Organic Regulatory Specialist for the Procurement Division with Grain Millers. We have Angela next to me with Prairie Sun Organics. We have Kate Mendenhall, who is the Director of the Organic Farmers Association, if you're an organic farmer, and you didn't know about the Organic Farmers Association, you should, and Kate's going to talk about why. So this is just a little bit about my background. Um, I have a little bit of an academic background, but I'm also really passionate about agriculture. I've been involved in the commercial ranching business um, in several states. And then I got involved in compliance in agriculture. And so for a couple years, I was a feedlot compliance officer. And there's a lot of good stories with that job if you want to talk about some of those over a beer later. Um, but it led me to the organic inspecting world. And so for three years straight, all I did was travel. I think I ended up in seven states total. Um, and I did everything from food processing, potato chips, vodka, pet food, meat processing, um, all the way to dairy farms, crop operations. So I've also worked with a lot of organic brokers and traders as well. So that's where this topic is something I'm passionate about. Um, and actually in the picture with me, you'll see Rebecca Ritson on my left, who's gonna talk next. But I thought I'd do a really quick overview about who administers and enforces organic regulations. I know there's some folks in here who are, who are certified organic, some folks who are just contemplating it. So I just wanted to lay a little bit of a groundwork before we launch into this important discussion. Um, so the NOP is an arm of the USDA who makes the final rules and regulations organic operations are subject to. And then the National Organic Standards Board is a group of pretty diverse folks that kind of help filter through public comment. Um, so recently, this strengthening organic enforcement proposed rule, there was public comment made on that. And so it's the NOSB's job to kind of interpret that. Um, and here's just a quick chart of, you know, who's who in organic enforcement. So we talked about the NOP. We're gonna use a lot of acronyms today. Um, we talked about the NOP, the National Organic Program, and the National Organic Standards Board, and then certifiers are really kind of the long arm of the law for those folks. There's about 80 certifiers in the United States, um, give or take a few. And then of course, inspectors are the boots on the ground for those certifiers. And of course, certified entities who is subject to these regulations. Um, organic integrity is a really big conversation. Um, here's just some quick points about certifiers. Certifiers are audited by the National Organic Program at least once a year, sometimes more. Um, inspectors, there's also regulations about what inspectors can or can't do and how they can or can't collaborate with the operations they inspect. Um, and of course, the organic system plan, that's the bedrock of how operations are supposed to be managing their organic system, whether it's crops or processing. That is a binding legal document. Um, and unannounced inspections, that's a big component of this strengthening organic enforcement conversation. Um, you know, this is just two 
quick blips that have made the news in the last couple years, some major fraud has taken place in this industry. I think just between these two cases, it's about $250 million. Um, but they were prosecuted. And so that's where the USDA and inspectors like me, people who work in certification, people who work in the industry, this has really brought a lot of awareness to, okay, how do we do a better job? So that's what we're gonna talk about. This is a lot of text. I know a lot of folks probably can't read all of this, um, but this is sort of the breakdown of all the different components of the proposed rule. So, Rebecca, I see you. You have that beautiful background there. Rebecca is going to take over for a minute and talk about her perspectives on some of this enforcement activity. Yes, and will you guys be uh, showing my presentation, or do I need to pull that up? Go ahead and try to pull it up. I'm not sure if you're going to get all of the black and everything, or do you just see the slides? We see your presenter view. Hmm. I don't know what to do about that. There's going to be a little bit of this today. It's all right. <laughs> there we go. Better? Yeah, it looks good. OK. Um, yeah. So. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about something that I'm pretty passionate about as well. Uh, I'm Rebecca Ritson. I'm the Organic Regulatory Specialist for Grain Millers. And um, Grain Millers is a food grade ingredient processing company. We buy food grade whole grains and um, our mills process those into ingredients that are used in a variety of different foods. So. I came to Grain Millers actually from a organic certification background for about three years. I was a farm and livestock reviewer, and I've been with Grain Millers in this role for about three years as well. Um, so yeah, just some background there on the company and what we do. And Grain Millers has locations throughout Canada and the United States. So our headquarters is in Eden Prairie. Uh, we have several mills in Wisconsin, Oregon, Iowa, Indiana, and then another mill up in Canada, as well as some cleaning facilities and an elevator. Um, just to give you an idea of sort of the scope of what we're working with, for organic sourcing, we are working with about 400 Canadian producers and 300 US producers. We do try to buy direct from the farm whenever possible, and we're pretty successful in doing that for the majority of our product, but occasionally we do end up buying from elevators or traders. and um, Really the point of this is just when you're working with this many suppliers, any inconsistencies in the rule do get problematic and become really evident and any gaps in the supply chain areas that aren't required to be certified or where things are sort of optional can also create some problems and um, be really an issue for us as the buyer and sometimes for the farmer and that is part of where my interest in uh, strengthening organic enforcement comes from. Um, so where we buy our organic grain, this is just to give you guys an idea. And it's not to say that uh, we don't buy from South Dakota. This is just where we get a lot of our products. Uh, our biggest grain that we buy and manufacture is oats. So we try to source that very widely. We're also buying flax, um, food grade corn, wheat, barley, all of those we're really trying to buy domestically or from Canada. Um, but then we also buy some specialty grains, things like grains and seeds, I should say. So things like uh, quinoa and sesame and amaranth, and those aren't grown in the US. And so we have to source those from other countries like Bolivia, the EU, Paraguay, India, and Uganda. And that's another piece of why strengthening organic enforcement is really critical um, to me and to my role because those times we can't buy that direct from the farmer. There's no way you can find a farmer in Bolivia that's going to source all of the quinoa that you need and get that to the US. So that is being purchased through other companies and that lengthens our supply chain and that uh, really makes us wanna know that we've got strong, consistent organic regulations and enforcement going on. So my 
my take on this panel topic is really just continuous improvement. And I think that there are four areas that really feed into us being able to have that continuous improvement of the organic standards and organic certification. And the first one of those and the most obvious and kind of the driver for this topic today is regulatory program changes. So obviously the strengthening organic enforcement proposed rule has gone through comment period. We're waiting on the final rule to see just how much of the proposed rule is going to make it into actual regulation, um, what changes they make, what ends up getting cut. Um, and that will have a huge impact on some of those inconsistencies in supply chain gaps that I was speaking about. So that is huge um, and eagerly awaiting that and happy to talk at length about that when we have more time on the panel because I did participate in the Organic Trade Association's task force for strengthening the organic enforcement uh, comments that they put forth. And then Grain Miller's put in our own like seven page comment just on the areas that matter to us because 20 plus points of that rule, not all of those are things that we're concerned with, but there were seven or eight that are really critical to our business. Uh, another area that kind of falls under that regulatory program change heading is trade arrangement changes. So uh, the most current one is the uh, the end of the US India recognition agreement. And that was just announced earlier this year. Um, and that means it's starting in 2022. If an operation in India is not accredited or is not certified by a USDA accredited certification body, they can't bring product to the US anymore. So that's gonna make major, major changes um, and hopefully reduce a lot of uh, the questionable practices and lack of transparency that's been an issue uh, with that recognition agreement. Um, so there's always a potential for other trade arrangement changes as well. And I know that what I've heard is that that specific end to that recognition agreement was due to concerns um, and actual observed issues and so knowing that the NOP can act on that, although it does take them a while to do so, is huge. And then additional rulemaking is always a piece. Um, SOE is really the first rule in, I think, the history of the, or the first change in the history of the regulation that's covering all parts of, of the supply chain. Previously, there was a, a livestock rule update about pasture. Um, but otherwise, a lot of what we have now is the same as what it was when it came out in 2002. And um, other countries are updating the regulations a little bit more frequently. Canada, it's like every five years, I know. So additional rulemaking on a more frequent basis to help us drive our industry forward and to really improve upon the requirements. So that's that's the main focus today. The other three areas, I'll just run through them really quickly. Um, this one is really near and dear to my heart, education and training. I think it's so important, um, especially that some of the other parts of the supply chain, not necessarily growers, are informed about the standards and the requirement. So um, the tools that are being developed right now, like the Organic Integrity Learning Center, that's gonna be really huge for certifiers and inspectors. And also, I think a lot of handlers and brokers and traders could benefit from doing some of those courses. That's all free content um, that's available to anyone that's interested. It's maybe not immediately applicable uh, to growers, but anybody else. And also growers, if you just want to be informed about what certifiers and inspectors are supposed to be doing or supposed to be looking at, that information is now um, becoming available and they're going to continue to grow that resource, I believe. And then um, events like May, May's team puts on, and events like Organic Economy Training Series or OATS. I know that was uh, just starting off right before the pandemic and maybe will actually come back afterward to get information about organic out to more service providers since that's been kind of a, an overlooked area in the past. Um, the third one, is industry-driven initiatives and tools. And I really see those as a temporary or a, a support to the regulatory changes. But 
things like organic fraud prevention solutions from OTA, which is intended more for processors and handlers like grain millers, um, or tools that can be purchased like Check Organic, those can help to um, narrow some of those gaps in the rules that have been found while the regulations get put into place and come into enforcement. And so I see that as an area where we'll continue to hopefully see the development of these initiatives and tools as the need arises to temporarily put a Band-Aid on the problem until a longer, more permanent fix can be found. And then the last piece to continuous improvement that I think is so important, and it's why I'm glad I'm able to be on this panel today, um, is engagement. So conferences and events, and I'm, I'm missing out on a key part of a conference and event, which is the downtime and the coffee breaks and the dinners and just interacting with people and getting their experiences and opinions and adding that to my own and then determining, you know, like, oh, maybe there's a concern here. Maybe there's not as much as I thought. That's so critical. Um, and it's so critical for just different parts of the supply chain to be able to talk to each other at those types of events. And I really miss that. So I appreciate the opportunity to participate today, um, even though I can't be there to, to have dinner with you guys and go bowling. Um, and then things like membership organizations are, I think, major. And so we've got Kate here um, with Organic Farmers Association, which is fantastic. Uh, other organizations like National Organic Coalition and the Organic Trade Association. Individuals don't have the time to stay on top of every issue themselves. So these organizations do such a huge, huge part by coming up with like the distilled talking points and the this is what you need to know. These are the breaking issues. And then in turn, being able to turn to those organizations and say, hey, I'm noticing this, or I heard this, or this has been my experience and also my neighbors, um, so that they have information that they can piece together and figure out when there are new concerns um, that need to be brought up to the NOSB and to NOP so that we can push the standards forward. I might've taken a little too much time. Um, that's all I've got for right now and happy to go into any of those further once we move on. You're fine. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And Rebecca and I actually were former coworkers at a certifier. And so we've spent a lot of time talking about some of these issues. She's so knowledgeable and um, we don't have a ton of time to take questions today. But if anyone has a question you'd like me to relay to Rebecca, I'm happy to do that. Um, so with that, we'll move on to Angela has some stuff to say about her perspective and her experience on strengthening organic enforcement. Thank you. So I'm Angela Jackson. I'm from Vermilion, South Dakota. Um, I've lived here for about 22 years. I have a certified organic farm by Mosa down in Vermilion, and we largely raise poultry and some crops and vegetables. We sell eggs to Hy-Vee in the past, and we also sell uh, frozen chicken. We process on farm, so we have a semi-mobile certified organic processing plant where we, po we process uh, everything on farm. And um, when not doing that, I have worked in organic regulatory uh, enforcement for the last, I don't know, 12, 15 years. I started out as an organic inspector, and I'm a member of the um, Organic Inspectors Association. I'm also uh, with, with the International Organic Accreditation Service, working in 36 different countries around the world. So I'm very familiar with the international exchange of organic products around the world currently. I'm also working with the Regenerative Organic Certified. Uh, standards and I've started working with them this year and helping to grow and expand that program. I also have my hands on a lot of other things. I sit on a lot of committees and boards. I also sit on the executive board um, for this um, South Dakota Specialty Producers Association and I'm also on the NRCS Technical Committee for the State of South Dakota. Um, think, oh, and the other most important role, <laughs> besides being a grandmother, is I'm chair of the South Dakota Drift uh, pesticide Drift Working Group, which is a group that was formed um, from a roundtable meeting with the Secretary of Agriculture two years ago. We have a very active group, and I encourage all of you to check us out on Facebook and to please join because we need your voice at that table. Why are we having this conversation today? I want to just read to you something that was posted on the Associated Press on February 14, 2020. 
A federal, prosecu federal prosecutors have charged a Rapid City businessman in what they say was a $71 million scheme to sell fake organic grain and seeds to fuel his extravagant lifestyle, including a yacht, a multi-million dollar home, and luxury cars. This $71 million organic fraud situation puts South Dakota on the map. It also is why we're talking today. And if you think this isn't a huge conversation, just go to any regulatory body or any lawmaker in the state of South Dakota and they'll say, hmm, can organic really be real in South Dakota? Because they're just reading what the news says. So this, what we're talking about today, strengthening organic enforcement, is probably one of the most important things that we can be talking about right now. This action was the single largest piece of rulemaking since the implementation of the NOP regulations. So I'm also with a member of the Organic Trade Association, and I'm also a member of um, the Organic Farming Farmers Association. And I was part, also part of the team um, that was making comments uh, through the Organic Trade Association on this particular um, rulemaking. You can find, and I just want to give a little plug to the OTA because the Organic Trade Association did a really great job putting together a 20-page summary report, which you can find on their website. So if you just go to ota.com forward slash advocacy forward slash critical issues forward slash oversight, organic oversight enforcement, you'll find it or just Google it, the OTA organic enforcement. It was a, really, they've done a fantastic job of summarizing all of the main points. And you should be familiar with this as Rebecca alluded to there's 20 different points in here there's no way we're going to cover all of them today but if you're an organic producer and you're thinking about getting into crops or livestock so i just want to talk about a couple of things that might affect you um, one of them is unannounced inspections so as part of this rule it's important to have unannounced inspections on the farm so they're going to keep those at five percent and also standardizing organic certificates across certification bodies so part of my job in the past is I audited the certification bodies. And one of the things that I really struggled with was all the different types of organic certificates and what they look like. And even today, um, in my, I st we still struggle, is this certificate valid or not? Or is it legal or not? Does it have all the language it needs to have? Because these products do come in for overseas. And so it's kind of, you need to know that. So um, just in summary, I just want to walk through how, uh, just an example of an organic egg supply chain um, works. Okay, so this is actually you know what I go what impacts me as an organic farmer. So a certified organic farm produces organic corn. The corn is transported via an uncertified truck to a local grain elevator where it is aggregated with other organic grain from nearby producers. An uncertified commodity trader buys the corn. Now this is the way current way before the amended changes, or recommended changes, or proposed changes. Then the corn is transported via an uncertified truck to an uncertified storage facility, and both transport and storage are subcontracted, not owned by the commodity trader. Then the commodity trader sells the corn to a certified organic grain supplier. The two parties remain anonymous because they use an uncertified broker to facilitate the transaction. The corn is transported via an uncertified rail and river barge to a grain supplier. It is transloaded and stored temporarily several times before being delivered to the certified grain supplier. The certified organic grain supplier then stores the corn, combines it with imported organic corn purchased from an importer via an uncertified broker. The certified grain supplier then sells the corn to a certified organic feed processor. The corn is then transported via an uncertified truck. The certified processor combines the corn with several other ingredients to create the organic chicken feed, which we buy. Then the, then the certified processor sells the feed to a certified organic egg producer, me, and transports it via an uncertified truck. Okay? The certified organic egg producer then sells the organic eggs to an uncertified retailer, which in this is case, IV, and the uncertified retailer sells the organic eggs to the consumer. So that's just like a hypothetical situation of what can actually happen. And I... have being that I've worked in the supply chain for a long number of years and I've had to actually try to audit this thing, it's extraordinarily challenging. And I know that May can really Life is not easy for organic inspectors. It's not. And when you're an auditor and you're looking at this paper trail and you're trying to figure this out, it's very, very challenging. So 
as a farmer, it's really important for me to know that when I purchase grain from a certified organic feed mill, that all the ingredients that went into that feed has been um, traced and has not been contaminated anywhere along the pathway. Because if there was a recall, then that would be an issue for me because then I'd have to get high V involved and we'd have to, and it would be a really bad mark on my name. So as a producer, this, this particular proposed amendment, if it passes, would be really important to me because it would also um, require that more of the entities in that supply chain, those that are actually handling it, um, are uh, certified. So I just wanted to share that little hypothetical story that I think that for organic producers, this is a real win, putting on my, my uh, organic producer hat. <laughs> Um, no, I have questions for yes. you. I think okay. we have just a couple of minutes um, and, and Kate will have time if we don't um, get enough time to, since she's going to be chatting with us after lunch as well. So, um, you know, you said a lot of uncertified. So I just wanted to kind of clarify or see your thoughts on, because there are brokers out there that choose to be certified that aren't required to. So can you clarify that for folks? Yeah, so in um, currently in the organic regulations, if you're um, a broker of the product or you're uh, distributing the product or transporting or storing the product, you don't have to get certified. So you can choose to get certified if you want to, but you don't have to. Um, some of the other things that we ran into is that um, some of these storage facilities can be subcontractors under the farmer or under the processor and they're under that certification and so they don't then in themselves have to carry the certification so they may not all the time well they may not in every case be inspected every year so that's an important that even if they're not certified they should be inspected every entity in the chain should be inspected that's my personal opinion because sometimes they're just storing it and they're not handling it and trying right. to define the difference between the two is quite challenging sometimes. Um, well, that's all, the, that's all I'm going to pepper you with for now. It's awesome that you're here as a resource for folks in the room um, throughout the event, too, to, to ask more questions. And I guess we'll let Kate um, take it away. I'm really excited to hear from you. Kate, can you hear us? Okay. Well, while we're waiting for Kate to pull back up, you know, since we have two inspectors up here, if anybody has a question for your friendly neighborhood organic inspector, um, now's your chance. Head up to the mic. Awesome. Hi, my name is Myron Buller. I'm just beginning, uh, began organic transition in 2016, so I'm very new at this. Um, question I have r relates to Ms. Ritson. Um, mentioned that, uh, I believe it was India, uh, shipments had stopped because of um, not being certified or traceable or whatever. Would you say there is still a, a major um, amount of non-organic crops and materials coming into the states as organic, even to this day? I mean, are we still dealing with that as a big problem? I think, honestly, it's a small percentage, but the bad actors that manage to find these exploits in the system really do get away with as much as they can. Um, so that is why changes like the end of the recognition agreement are so important. I know that it took them a long time to come to doing that. And um, it was, I believe, in part because of repeat issues with transparency and product not being as traceable as it is expected to be under the NOP regulations. So I think it still is happening. 
Uh, I know with the major crackdown in the Black Seas region and now this change for India, we're it's getting stamped out when it is found, but there's always going to be somebody out there trying to make money off of the fact that organic goods sell for a higher premium, unfortunately. And so, yeah, the continued diligence by, um, I mean, everyone in the supply chain is definitely necessary. And that's where the engagement piece is so critical, uh, where when you hear from one part of the supply chain concerns, it's worth looking into. Um, and when we don't have that engagement and that crosstalk, I, things like that can get missed and continue on for longer than anybody wants and really damage the trust in organic integrity. Rebecca, I'm trying to remember, um, cause that Black Sea region was the cause of a great deal of fraudulent imports for a while. And I want to say like 30 or more percent of them just all of a sudden weren't certified after there started being crackdowns. Do you remember that percentage? I know you have a good memory. I do not remember the percentage. I know the number of uh, certified operations in Turkey fell dramatically by, yeah. I want to say, hundreds. Um, yeah. So even just like the increased scrutiny when things start to get suspicious yes. really scares a lot of the questionable people out of the out of the trade why well, I, mean, I would like to see them face uh, harsher pe penalties than just uh leaving but you know every little bit helps i guess awesome well it looks like we got kate's uh presentation up on the screen here kate if you are ready to take it away can you hear me yeah okay great um, my computer is freezing a little bit. I'm trying to um, stop the video. That sometimes help, but helps, but hopefully um, comes back on board. So I um, am the director of the Organic Farmers Association. We're a national organization created in um, late 2016 to be a strong voice for certified organic farmers at the national level. We represent certified organic farmers in Washington, D.C., we have a policy director who serves um, part of her time as our lobbyist. And, oh shoot, can you still hear me? We can hear you, Chris. Are we seeing her screen up there? We're still not seeing your screen. So why don't we go ahead and try to pull up your presentation, if that's okay, and yeah. um, just kind of do your best to talk through your slides as we advance them for you. Okay, and I was able to stop my video, so hopefully that helps too. Thank you. Um, all right. Let we got see. your slides up here, it looks like, so you're good to go. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so I'm also a small certified organic producer in Okaboji, Iowa, in the northwest corner, not too far um, from where you all are today. So I thank you for letting me join you virtually, but. Um, Hopefully next time I can be there in person. So I wanted to spend my time going into a little bit more detail about um, the actual um, comments that we submitted to the strengthening organic enforcement rule from um, a farmer perspective and the places where we feel like it's really important for farmers to submit comment and be a part of the dialogue here. Um, I'm sorry that this is, Okay, I think this will be better. So if you could go to the next slide for me. Um, yeah, this is just what are what is OFA? We are a farmer run organization and then the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, can you go back one? Thank you. So I just wanted to encapsulate this. Um, we've been, fraud is not new, especially in the grain market for organic, unfortunately, but um, we have been making some headway, especially with some directives from the 2018 Farm Bill. So I know that grain growers throughout the Midwest have been noticing um, decrease in pay price, and a lot of that has been due to a lot of imports coming in. And there's been a lot of questions about could these countries sending these imports actually grow this amount of corn and soybeans? Um, what are the 
what sort of verification is happening over there. There have been some shipments that come over that members of the organic farmer community have highlighted as a high likelihood of a fraudulent grain. But what we found is that the National Organic Program has very little authority at the U.S. ports to stop sale and to require um, authenticity of organic. And so the 2018 Farm Bill has put in some requirements for them to build a plan to stop that. And the Strengthening Organic Enforcement um, rule, proposed rule, is a part of that piece. If you could go to the next slide. Um, the Strengthening Organic Enforcement rule has been a long time coming, but it was released um, mid-2020 for our first round of comments, and we expect it'll circulate a couple times, but I want to sort of highlight the places where Organic Farmers Association made note in our comments, and um, if you're a member of Organic Farmers Association, we alert you to when these type of opportunities for public comment are, and we share with you talking points that we feel are most important to farmers, priorities, and needs so that we can help um, May pinpoint the places where your comments are most important and can be most productive, especially on farmer um, issues. So our first comment on this on the strengthening organic enforcement rule was that it was too big. Um, they put a lot of things into this rule that weren't directly targeting fraud and that is where we need immediate action. And so we asked them to break out the pieces that were more complex. There's a large um, discussion around grower group certification in the Strengthening Organic Enforcement Act, and that is important, but perhaps more complicated than the, and will stall the rule where the pieces are more concrete and we need action right now, like um, preventing fraud. So that was one of our comments. The other was that there's a lot of emphasis on auditing of organizations and certifiers, which is important, but we also want to make sure that enforcement by the National Organic Program and by certifiers has a high priority as well. We want to make sure that we're preventing fraud, not just finding it once it's here. And then the third piece of these overarching suggestions that we made is that um, they have talked about um, a lot of places where we need more um, regulatory action and certifiers, but we wanna make sure that the National Organic Program is making an effort and is specifying in the rule how they are gonna increase their capacity to do enforcement, to track fraud and to stop fraudulent grain from entering the country or for um, being distributed if it's domestic. So we wanted to see more commitment from our National Organic Program there. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, three more pieces for these overarching suggestions. Certifier oversight was really increased in the proposed rule, but again, we want more National Organic Program oversight. So um, in enforcement, but also oversight of the certifiers. So if there's a certifier who has let some things slip through, we wanna make sure that the NOP, the National Organic Program, is looking at their accreditation um, role and making sure that the certifiers are complying with the standards and are doing their diligence on enforcement. Um, and then the next one was that there's a lot of new requirements burdening individual parts of the organic supply chain, which are great, but we also want the NLP to raise its standards too. So let's not put all of the new requirements um, on farmers and the players of the supply chain. We also want the NOP to take responsibility. Sorry about that. Can you still hear me? <laughs> we can. Um, and then also um, interagency coordination. So it's in it's really important that 
the National Organic Program is working very closely with Customs and Border Protection and with APHIS at the border because the National Organic Program does not have authority currently to stop sale, to investigate ships as they're arriving. And so they need to educate Customs and Border Protection and APHIS, who are the primary people at the ports of entry, on what, number one, what organic is, um, what an organic certificate is, what organic means so that there's we're not fumigating organic product um, and if it is fumigated that it leaves the organic supply chain that we're verifying organic before it leaves the ship and then disperses into the um, u.s transportation system and we can't track it after that that has been a problem so um, one thing that was really focused on on the strengthening organic enforcement rule was the definition of handlers and so the national organic program um, did work on that. We were asking for more terms to be added to the definition of handler. Um, people who are importing, people who are exporting, transloading, relabeling products, splitting, opening, packaging, private labeling, and sorting. These people have been exempt from organic certification, but we are seeing that this definition needs to be expanded. Anyone who's touching organic product and changing it in some way, whether it's repackaging it or taking it off a bulk ship and putting it into smaller containers to go places, they need to understand organic and be inspected to make sure that they're following the same standards that producers at the farm level are, are following. Um, there is a, there still is an exemption for um, some transportation, but we raised the question if large bulk shipments and permeable containers should not be exempt from the transportation piece. Um, also, we recommend that people doing private label, so taking bulk, um, repackaging it, put another label on it, that since they're touching it and repackaging it, they should be required to be certified. So just increasing the, the verification of all steps of these supply chains. And these seem to be places where there's a bit of a weak link. Um, US organic farmers work so hard on the farm to produce products with high integrity. It just really undermines all of that great work when we're letting um, fraudulent products slip in. And much, you know, oftentimes there's um, lower quality product that ends up um, undermining the overall product and um, for sure price at the farm gate. So a few other additional handler requirements that we suggested would be a uniform affidavit process that the National Organic Pro Program outlines in a easy um, to understand way so that all of the places where something comes in and goes through the supply chain, there's some sort of process to trace that. Um, we would like to see the responsibility for that affidavit being placed on the buyer, not the farmer. Um, and also, um, we highlighted that a place where there may be um, a higher risk is in storage facilities. Those are still um, proposed to be exempt from certification or under the handler requirements, but sometimes these storage facilities are touching product, changing it where it goes, and we need to make sure that there's not commingling happening there. I think that's perhaps, you know, one of the, the problems that we saw in some of our domestic fraud cases. And for sure, we've seen that um, at the ports, especially with bulk shipments going into container or trucks. Um, and then port and transportation activities as well. We would like to see more handler requirements there. Next slide. So import certificates is a huge change. This was specifically identified in the 2018 Farm Bill as necessary. And I think it's really interesting because I've talked to farmers who were involved in the writing of the organic standards. And in the early to mid 1990s, it and even before, um, you know, in the workings towards getting the 1990 Organic Food Production Act, thinking that we would be having so many organic imports coming to this country just was not even a piece of the conversation at that time. Um, organic was still such a small piece of the market that this just really wasn't built into the, into the, the sector and the standards. So um, we're behind the game here, but the um, strengthening organic enforcement and these import certificates are um, trying to, you know, mine the gap and get these the systems into compliance. So, import certificates should really help. 
We uh, made some recommendations though onto the proposal. So we think that the import certificates must accompany the shipment. Um, the proposal says that they can be sent later, but how are the, um, the Customs and Border Protection and APHIS folks supposed to know that something's organic if they don't have the certificate on board? Um, we also think that these organic shipments need to be uploaded as it, um, the product leaves the foreign port before it comes to the US so that people know what the ship is carrying and that it's organic before it arrives and definitely when it comes into the port. Um, we do not think it should be unloaded onto US soil until they have that import certificate. And then um, if anyone has done a lot of transport or looked into our US port system, I have learned a lot about our port system and um, they have a lot of responsibilities and the people there are working on keeping a lot of other things out of our US borders. And most of them do not know what organic is. I've had a lot of alarming conversations with people in Customs and Border Protection that actually are going onto these ships and they, they just really have no idea. And so we need a lot more education, but until we have a really good tight system, we're suggesting to maybe limit the ports of entry for organic so that the staff at the ports where organic can come in are very knowledgeable. They understand what they're looking for with an import certificate. They understand how to detect a fraudulent certificate and they, um, they, you know, they know what organic is and the requirements necessary. Um, and we want there to be a very concrete organic import um, data captured and a plan for implementing this whole thing. You could go to the next slide. Um, so I just put this quote in from our comments because I think it really speaks to a lot of what we need to accomplish. The NOP's ability working with the Customs and Border Protection and other agencies to flag shipments whose information cannot be verified while still at the port is what will have a deterrent effect on parties considering an attempt to import fraudulent products. If you have a high value um, shipment and you can't unload it until it's been verified, and the NLP has the authority to keep it on that ship until it's verified, there's gonna be a lot more incentive to make sure you have all of your ducks in a row and the, the verification is there. Um, and then we also think that this issue with import fraud is so important for American growers um, that we can't, it, we can't be strict enough here. We think that the, the strengthening organic enforcement rule should go beyond the ACE um, system, which is part of the Customs and Border import um, system. We think it should, and above the import certificates, we think that they should be using all the tools that they have at the ports of entry, bills of lading, insurance certificates, and the ship manifest to confirm organic product. And and identify if there's any red flags that would require a little bit deeper investigation. There's a piece of the strengthening organic enforcement rule that identifies labeling of non-retail containers. So um, I know quite a few folks who ship grain within the US, um, especially some marketing cooperatives are using tamper-proof proof seals on their products. We um, are recommending that type of seal or tamper proof seal. Um, you know, we're in the 21st century, so let's look at things that really can be verified and is secure that there isn't any commingling after a confirmed organic product leaves um, for the US. So we're, um, hoping that the NLP definition of non-retail containers would be expanded to include tankers, containers, barges, etc. cetera. Um, and then there's been quite a few ships that have been identified with fraudulent organic rain to be coming in bulk ships. So these are ships that the whole hold of the ship contains loose grain. They're not in stacked containers like the picture you see here. Um, those a lot of grain is going into that ship and so it's more likely that with all of that 
um, mixing that there could potentially be conventional grain mixed in with all of that organic grain. And we're questioning whether or not bulk shipments are too large for organic if it can't be sealed and if we can't verify all of the um, the product coming in. So should we require within organic to ship just in containers? Or should we require that the bulk shipments have a verification in the tamper-proof seals in place? Um, you know, organic includes higher um, requirements to to um, secure that it is what it is, and the audit trails need to be there. So if we can't confirm it under bulk shipments, maybe those should not be allowed, especially not at you know at this moment until it can be. Next slide, please. Um, so our full comments are accessible online. Um, if you, you know, want to review those, we will be in touch with our members when um, the next review of public comment comes forward and we anticipate, um, you know, that to be coming hopefully this year. It's a short link. It's also available on our website on the homepage through our news section. If you scroll through, these were submitted in um, October. So it's case sensitive, um, bit.ly is the short link and then OFA SOE, strengthening organic enforcement. And then we also, around that same time, I think it was in um, August or September, we posted a blog piece on our website outlining um, an organic fraud article that was included in our magazine this fall, New Farm Magazine, but we've also have it on our website. And so that outlines some of the um, domestic fraud case that Angela outlined in her discussion with a little bit more detail. And that's really interesting and gives folks a, a better sense of, of fraud. Um, I do want to note that unfortunately, organic fraud is not just in grains. You know, obviously those are large quantities and they are quickly dispersed, but we have seen some fraud concerns in the produce industry. And so just across the board, we need to protect consumers' confidence in the organic label by making sure that um, our auditing and our, um, our organic standards are in place to prevent fraud because at the end of the day, we have a strong organic seal and label because consumers trust that. And so that's what's worth protecting. Um, and then my last slide, please. Thank you so much. Um, I just encourage you, we'll be talking a little bit more about Organic Farmers Association over the lunch hour, but um, to join Organic Farmers Association, we're here to um, ask you what your policy concerns are and you as certified organic farmer members of OFA determine the work that we do and the priorities and where we spend our time. Um, so you can learn more at our website, organicfarmersassociation.org. We are farmer led, farmer run, and so we were created to really be your voice and advocate for you in Washington. Um, and there's my email if you have specific questions. Sorry about the technology problems. You're fine. We plan for that, Kate. Thank you so much for joining us today. I think we had a really fun conversation. I know we're running a tiny bit over, but if there, we'll have time for one question. If anybody wants to step up to the mic or throw a question in the chat, uh, more than happy to do that. Got a really good group of folks here to try to field some of these yeah uh my name is bill hazenkamp i'm a fifth year organic grower from beamer nebraska uh and this is for kate or anybody that wants to answer um i've talked to other organic growers and read about the possible or the actual discrepancies in the organic standards between processed grains and unprocessed grains where they talked about corn coming in for turkey now tell me if this is fact or fiction, and it 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 fails. It's for whatever reason they send it back, and that there's a different standard that that grain is rolled or processed, and it can come back in and can have a different level of contamination. We call it if it's a processed product. Uh, if you could clarify that, whether that's fact or fiction. Um, it's something a couple other growers talked to me about. I think Rebecca might be the best person to try to speak to that because I think you might be referring to like there's sometimes different scenarios where if it's cracked corn, yes, then it's treated a little differently. So, yeah, if, Rebecca, if you don't mind trying to kind of speak to that for a second. 
Um, so this is not something I've heard before. I know that there are tight regulations on imports because of APHIS requirements. So Plant Health Inspection Service, I believe that stands for. Um, and whole grain can't be brought in from certain countries because it might harbor pests. And so if that grain is cracked or flaked to a certain amount, it's considered enough to have potentially destroyed the pest. Um, that doesn't have any part on organic certification though. And so I know that came up with some of the fraudulent grain imports where the reason the ship was technically not allowed to unload was because the corn was not cracked enough. But I don't know that anybody's actually sampling um, these bulk grain shipments for any kind of pesticide residue would be the main thing that we would be looking at for organic to definitively say, no, that is above 5% of the EPA maximum residue level and it is can no longer be considered organic. I don't know if any testing like that is occurring. Um, maybe Angela. Those? I was mainly concerned whether it was pesticide levels or the, or this or that would be different because that would mm -hmm. seem so inconsistent. Yes, definitely. I have not heard of anything like that. That doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, and if you remember where you heard that, I would love to look into it more. I probably will try anyway, but I don't know how far I'll get. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I can add to that quickly if we have time. Sure, go for it. Um, Pesticide residue levels are not being tested at the border, and it's something that we we would not necessarily recommend because organic is a production system, and we want to make sure that it's not just about um, pesticide residues, that it's the full um, process of growing organic. Um, it can be a slippery slope if that becomes the measure of um, what organic is or is not. And so that's not typically the place where we would go for a policy solution um, because, you know, you could have a conventional product that doesn't have any pesticide residue, but that doesn't mean that it's organic um, and, and vice versa. Unfortunately, you know, there is organic product that may show up with pesticide residue through drift or um, something else where the you know the levels vary so while that shouldn't be in the organic marketplace um it, it's just not necessarily the most reliable test so we are looking more at making sure that the organic certification and accreditation and all of the audit trail processes are legitimate and that we're not perhaps um, allowing organic grains into this country if they're coming from high risk areas where the likelihood that they could grow that amount of certified organic corn from that particular country is very unlikely based on um, the agriculture from the country, the quantity of certified organic growers and acreage. And that has been more reliable in questioning the validity of the grain um, entering the country. And, and sometimes these ships are coming from, they've tried to go to the EU and the EU has rejected them. And so they've come to the United States. And so another recommendation we have is that the NOP is talking to our other trade partners. And when a ship is flagged for fraud, everyone knows about it. And it's not getting dumped in one of, you know, the small U.S. ports. All good points. Thank you so much, Kate. I know um, I've inspected some imports as well, and it's very much burned into my memory how much time it took to do that audit trail over four hours sometimes. Um, so it's a big topic and I hate to cut us short here, but we do have some other panelists waiting. So let's thank our panelists on this panel today for strengthening organic enforcement, all the work they do. Thank you, Becca. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Angela. Um, so we're going to transition into our next panel here and uh, be with you very shortly.